Great. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Pat Cox. He received his PhD in neuroscience from Georgetown University, working with Dr. Reisenhuber, and is currently a postdoc at George Washington University, working with Dr. Steve Mitroff. His postdoc work involves using big data to study visual search and object categorization. Um, I know Pat because I did my undergrad at George Washington, and as he was coming into the lab, I was leaving uh, to, to come here to Ohio. I normally look forward to seeing Pat in person and talking with him about his work at academic conferences, but things have been a bit different. Um, so it's quite a happy coincidence that he's come to talk with us here for our uh, workshop series. So let's give a warm welcome to Pat. Thank you very much for that intro, Paul. Um, yeah, happy to uh, happy to see you at least virtually when we can't see each other in person. Um, and thank you um, to uh, thank you to the whole group here for uh, inviting me and coming to see me talk. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you all today a little bit about some of my work uh, currently in my postdoc, leveraging some of the ways of thinking about data that I kind of learned do, during my grad school work when I was doing more work with brain imaging um, and uh, switched over to this sort of different approach that I think is also really unique and interesting and hopefully I can convince you all the same. Uh, so I'm going to start with a little bit of just background on sort of some of the stuff, a flavor of what I had done previously to sort of uh, begin this discussion. And then um, we can get into some of the nitty gritty of one particular analysis that I'm working on now, which I think was, um, you know, as we were just discussing sort of the, uh, as I understand it, the, the folks at this workshop is getting a little more into the detail. Um, and then I have just one more last thing as a potential future direction at the end, if we have time to get into it. So um, some of the questions that I have always been interested in is sort of like, what does it take for the brain to recognize an object and then what are the computations that underlie that? So, um, you know, and how can we model it and better understand it? Um, so some of the work I did in grad school involved a bunch of different brain imaging paradigms and MRI and DEG and, oh, this thing just advanced on its own. So like we would do things like uh, show people images and have them categorize them. And so this is sort of just a little, uh, diagram of a, a monkey and how the information might pass sort of, this is sort of a model of just that first sweep from the eye to the LGN and then up the ventral visual stream. And then we're, uh, you know, I think I have this on some kind of timer where it's advancing on its own. This is terrible. Anyway, um, but so this is some EEG data we collected and you can see from here, we were categorizing the information in this first sweep through visual and temporal uh, electrodes up to frontal and the blue here indicates um, information about category and <laughs> why is this sorry I'm this thing is like on some kind of timer where did this come from um, anyway so we sort of are interested in sort of the the uh, shape information that feeds forward into category information sorry I'm a little frazzled here my uh, slides are advancing on their own um, hopefully that stops. Um, but anyway, so uh, some of the work I did in grad school was sort of applying computational models to this. And so one, um, this is a hierarchical convolutional neural net that my grad school mentor, Max Riesenhuber, uh, kind of invented building off of previous convolutional neural nets. His main contribution was this idea of a max pooling step. So you have units that are tuned to something and you do sort of convolutions on an incoming image looking for edges. Uh, and then there's this cool step where you build up invariance by taking the maximum activation of neighboring things. So you get a more robust representation of those edges. And then you combine, you know, a bunch of different local edges to do features. So if you're say you're interested in doing faces, you know, you might be looking at patches that are like eye, pieces of eyes or pieces of mouths. And then again, you do another one of these max pooling steps to build up invariance. And then you can combine lots of features to uh, give you full object tuning. So like um, this is sort of those a lot of this work was done to mimic monkey tuning, but like, you know, IT here, or, you know, this would be sort of like similar to an FFA or something tuned to a view of an object would be something similar to like the LOC. Um, and so in that modeling framework, there's a lot of um, ideas of sort of two stages of processing where you have sort of this, this sort of uh, V1, V2 up to anterior, posterior IT or 
sort of the, the view-based um, representation. So experience of the world sort of will lead you to develop shape-based representation at this level. Um, and then you can leverage that sort of um, unsupervised shape-based representation of the visual world to learn lots of different tasks. So, you know, I could, you know, use that face example, right? I, I could develop a representation of uh, faces and I could use that representation to say, recognize Paul in this uh, grid of Zoom windows, or I could use it to tell if Paul is amused or unhappy with uh, me referencing Paul or the data. So you can use the same visual representations for numerous different tasks. And uh, it just you're sort of um, involves learning different supervised labels. So it's, it's an efficient reusing of the same visual representations. Um, so that's sort of a little bit of the computational theory behind uh, some of the work that I was doing previously, or some of the work that the lab that I was in was doing. And there are lots of um, actual um, empirical work that that goes and, and sort of looks for evidence of this. So for instance, you know, papers in human fMRI that show shape tuning in the LOC for a certain category of object and then category tuning in frontal or, you know, uh, labs that stick electrodes in monkeys' brains and show that there are, you know, uh, you know, unit, um, single units that really like single pictures of a certain dog in, um, you know, lower visual areas. And then in frontal areas, there are units that respond preferentially to all cats or all dogs. Um, and then some of the other work in the lab I was in previously then took some of this, the previous work we were doing in MRI and translated it into EEG and showed, you know, early posterior clusters of electrodes that showed shape tuning and then later uh, frontal clusters that showed category tuning. So these are just a bunch of different examples of how um, this sort of hierarchical processing of translating low level shape information to intermediate shape information to full object information and then slapping different labels on that full object information. Um, so then this is where some of my previous work jumps in just to give you guys a flavor of where I'm coming from. I feel like I'm already spending more time on this than I meant to, but uh, I asked the question of how in my, in my PhD thesis of how does extensive experience change these category representations? So uh, a lot of those previous studies were done with sort of just, just training people up to initial proficiency. So I had this really long training study where we, we had people come in, we, we created a little app to train people on these little car stimuli and had them learn to categorize this, this sort of vast morph space. Um, we had these people trained for weeks and weeks and weeks, 20 hours total, 30,000 trials. And we had them do a little bit of initial training and then we had them in for fMRI and EEG and then some behavioral testing. And then we did this weeks and weeks of training and then did all of it again. Um, and it was a, it resulted in a really, really cool data set, but it was a really arduous task to just get 11 people through this. There was a lot of you know, imaging people and having them drop out halfway through and things like that. So it was, uh, it was quite the adventure. Um, but at the end of the day, so this is just sort of the, the task, there are like um, these sort of prototype cars and then you could combine different amounts of each one to create this vast morph space. And then we threw a category boundary like sort of right along the middle of it. So we could do these neat things where we could systematically vary shape and category relationships to sort of look for the neural uh, signatures of shape information versus category information. So, you know, something like this car and this car are 20% different, but in the same category, this car and this car are 20% different, but in different categories, areas that treat this car and this car the same care more of the, as this car versus this car care about shape. Sorry. Uh, things that treat this car and this car differently than this car versus this car care about category. Um, so, the uh, just a, again, there's um, a, a lot more could go into this, but I want to give you guys just a flavor of some of the results we found similar to previous results. So this is sort of the, the, key, the key comparison is sort of this M3 within is that very similar shaped cars, but within category versus very similar shaped cars in different categories. Before extensive training, these vis this visual area treats that the same after it treats it as different and sort of so the this area in the ventral occipital temporal cortex sort of around LOC uh, initially cares about shape, but then after extensive experience cares about category. Uh, one of the drawbacks of MRI is its um, lack of temporal resolution, right? So is this actually part of that first pass of processing or is this just, uh, these people get really good at this categorization task and maybe this information about category is coming in in a feedback manner. So we looked at 
uh, a similar kind of design using EEG. Um, and we looked at sort of the earliest signatures of this difference between these two conditions that we care about, right? Um, a small shape difference that crosses the boundary versus doesn't. In the precondition, the earliest um, category signals are later and more frontal. Um, after extensive training, they're earlier and more posterior. So it's sort of this interesting support that um, it's perhaps the first pass through this system that is actually showing categorical information in the uh, lateral occipital cortex. So um, this was not, this is sort of the opposite of getting into the nitty gritty. This is a real 30,000 foot view of the kind of work I was doing before. Hopefully you all find it interesting. I would gladly talk about it more if anyone has questions or if we wanna you know, shoot me a question offline and, and talk more about it later. But this is just to give you a flavor of the kind of stuff I was doing before uh, as a bridge into what I'm doing now and, and how I'm thinking about it. So the stuff that I was doing before shaped a lot of the way I was thinking. Um, it also shaped a lot of the uh, decisions about what I was looking for in, in a postdoc. So as I alluded to before, the, the trials and tribulations of, uh, of a long longitudinal design uh, led me to uh, be really, really happy to come to a place that had an extensive data set that was already collected for me and just keeps amassing trials and I don't have to do anything about it. Um, but more to the point, I also, I really, um, really value sort of uh, um, a, a, an approach to asking questions about brain and neural mechanism that look for converging evidence from lots and lots of different approaches, different, each approach has its own strengths and its own weaknesses. Um, my, my grad career had fMRI and EEG and behavior and a little modeling. Um, so I was looking for something a little new and this sort of big data, like data mining behavioral sort of thing was a, a new tool that I could potentially add to my toolkit. So that's why one of the main reasons I came over uh, to GW for my, my um, postdoc. So we have this really fun airport scanner game. So there's a little uh, video animation. It's got these different levels um, and you can pick one and then you get to pretend you're a TSA security agent and these bags of things come through that have a lot of items, uh, sort of cartoony renditions of what items might look like on a scanner. That was a bomb, can't bring that on a plane. Um, and so we have these fun things where there are, that's a crossbow, that's hard to say. Um, and so these, these people are doing lots and lots of these trials where they're looking for a, a very large heterogeneous set of targets among a large heterogeneous set of distractors. Um, so it's, it's a lot more um, unconstrained and more like the real world than something we might do in the lab. Um, we don't do something like this in the lab because you know the, the name of science is sort of to control these features and explore them methodically. Um, and, and really when the rubber meets the road, there is um, the more complex your stimuli, the more data you need to try to separate out all of the different factors. You can't really can get enough subjects or enough trials to really parse out all of the complex underlying features in something like this in lab. Um, luckily, the um, and this is just another animation pointing out all of the different fun legal and illegal items. And um, they're very, very cartoony, but but it's, it's, it's kind of cool that we have this variation because it allows us to do some of that stuff that I was just referring to, right? So in lab, you know, you have to just vary, just shape or shape and color or an over very constrained set of um, parameters because you can only do, you know, tens to hundreds of subjects doing hundreds to thousands of trials. Um, but when you have people who find this game really amusing to the point that over 15 million unique installs have occurred and we've amassed over you know, 3.8 billion individual instances of these little bags searched. Um, the fact that we don't have as tight a control on the features um, can be can be a, a a good thing rather than a bug, right? So we can we can actually start to unpack this real this very complex real world search um, with a little more fidelity because we have the power to do so. Um, so the all of that was just a big uh, introduction to the, the, the main project I wanna talk about today, the one that we can, that I'm gonna really get into the nitty gritty of the approach and um, and how it's sort of inspired by my, my previous life as a brain imager. Um, and Dwight Kravitz has a, a, Dwight Kravitz has a similar background. You know, he's also sort of likes lots of converging mechanism and big theory, but um, you know, he did his postdoc as an imager. And so when he and I were discussing sort of um, how to tackle this problem, this, 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 this problem set, this, this big data, you know, it's, it's, 
it's really interesting that you can model all of these rich features, but it also becomes like sort of a, a different way of thinking. You have to come up with new approaches. So, um, so we've got lots and lots of different sort of really belaboring this large and heterogeneous stimulus point. But so we have lots and lots of distractors uh, with different shapes, colors, sizes, all kinds of different features. Uh, and the same thing with our uh, things that are not on a plane, allowed on a plane. Um, and so what, and then a further just uh, point about the game is there are different levels. So not only can we sort of look at the complex interactions of these different features and how it affects performance, but we can also look how it changes with uh, experience because the, the game roughly has a linear progression where there are these different airports and there are these different days in your sort of career at these airports. So you progress through the days and when you finish a certain airport, you move on to the next airport. Um, so with this, we are sort of able to track progress as people get more and more experience. Um, so what I'm going to describe now is this project that sort of has two parts. Uh, the first part is sort of just a, an empirical data-driven um, exploration of the similarity structure of the of the stimuli here. Again, uh, there's you know lots of different theories that uh, point to like the the similarity of the different objects really determines how difficult the search is going to be. Like. Uh, Humphreys is a big paper, uh, blank on the exact year, should have done a little more of uh, reminding myself of these things. But so the first part here is we're going to just sort of describe the complex shape of the, um, the similarity structure of these of these data. So for instance, so here's sort of we're getting into how we do this, right? So we might, for a given level of gameplay, look at all of the individual targets that could possibly appear and see how um, the presence of every possible individual distractor affects performance on that target. So what we have here is, so each of these uh, rows is a, is a target from that big heterogeneous display I showed. And each of these columns is an individual distractor. And what I do is I go through and look at, um, for every instance where these things co-occur, I calculate the mean uh, hit rate and then what I've done here is just, I've removed the mean hit rate for each of the targets so that you get an idea of whether the individual distractors is making something easier or harder to find. So, right, so like, and it also, some of the some of the individual targets are just in, are in and of themselves easier or harder. So this sort of puts it on an equal playing field, right? So we see um, there's some interesting structure here. And what we're gonna try and do is sort of try to see if we can describe what's going on. So step one, we say, you know, and, and I should mention with the size of this data, there's at least a thousand instances of each of these targets in each of, in the presence of each of these distractors. Um, and so what we do next is then, what we're interested in sort of um, sussing out some of the, the, the structure in what's affecting this performance, right? So what do we end up doing? Sorry, I should say, we're gonna do is we're gonna take um, every one of these columns in a pairwise fashion and compare them to each other. So basically like how similar is distractor one to distractor two in terms of its effect on this whole set of possible targets. And so if we do this for every single pair of distractors, we then have this big dissimilarity matrix. Really, the information is symmetrical, right? Because you know, comparing target one to target three is the same as target three to target one. And, and along the uh, diagonal here, that's just the identity comparing a thing to itself is it going to give you a Euclidean distance of zero, right? But so all of these is like, the, this is sort of the answer. This is the, the whole set of how each of these individual uh, distractors are uh, similar or dissimilar in how they affect search. Um, but looking at this, you can't really make any sense of it, right? That's not a interpretable representation of the data. So step three in this uh, empirical data-driven representation of the behavior is um, a step called multidimensional scaling. So what we do is we try to reduce the many, many dimensions in that previous dissimilarity matrix into um, just, you know, two or three of the top um, of the top most represented. We, we, we sort of smush it down into a visualizable set of dimensions, right? So um, what we do then is we take all of those distractors and the, the distance relationships are maintained as best as possible in this two dimensional representation. Um, and I'm gonna do this for every level, but for, for the, the first step here, just looking at 
level one. Um, so again, this is purely data-driven. We haven't baked in any hypotheses to this. And you can see already that um, there are some, there's some structure that's obvious here, right? The, the first and foremost thing that leaps out is things of similar colors grouped together. We've got these orange things here and these blue things here. And in the middle are these sort of like uh, green blue kind of things. And furthermore than that, they're sort of, um, you know, perhaps something going on with shape or feature. There are bigger, blockier things. And then there are these sort of coily things with wires. And, you know, you can play these fun things of like looking at this uh, empirically like uh, driven structure of the data and say, oh, what do we think is actually underlying this? Um, and then we can also do it, um, as I said, this, this game has levels. So we can see how this changes across levels. So I'll just, uh, skip through, I'll just sort of progress through the, the first five levels of this game after practice. So that was level two to level three, level four, level five. And again, so you can sort of um, start to look at this and you, you see that something's happening here because some of these uh, clusters are, are spreading out. So uh, something is being learned and something is making, um, you know, the, the representation, particularly within this blue group, spread out a bit, um, which we think is kind of cool. And you can have some fun and sort of say, oh, like, you know, based on just the data, what does it look like is happening here? Um, so, you know, just you might develop a hypothesis or, you know, in some ways, this is more of a proof of principle and a sanity check, right? That we would have expect color would have a big effect and it, it does appear to do so. And, and it seems like with experience, something beyond color is starting to matter, but, um, that is sort of just a cool data driven thing, but like, let's do some science here, right? Let's come up with some different hypotheses and some models and test some theories. So, so part two of this is the part, um, you know, this whole approach is largely influenced by my previous uh, sort of interest in, in brain imaging. And particularly, I think a lot of you hopefully maybe have heard of um, like representational similarity analysis or sort of this idea of, you can look at a whole set of voxels and show it a bunch of different things and then see how um, basically like the, the multi-dimensional representation of uh, those in those different objects in the brain, uh, you know, can be predicted in the similar way that I've sort of showed you. And you can then take sort of these big, build up these dissimilarity matrices in different neural measures and you can do it in behavior like I've just shown and you can do it with computational models. And then you can, you know, in and of itself, these things don't, you know, lend themselves better or worse to direct comparison. But once you've gotten yourself out of these individual spaces and into a dissimilarity matrix type space, it becomes very easy to go between and, com and compare each of these different things. So, so in the second part, what we're going to do then is to start to do some of this. So we're going to say, um, you know, I don't currently do any brain imaging, going to hopefully apply for some funding and get some of this stuff in that direction. Um, but so right now, like we have this, 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 uh, the similarity structure that I just showed you for the behavior. And what we might want to do is start making some, some models and try to actually unpack what are the features that actually are leading to, uh, that structure, um, beyond just the first blush sort of color type things. And how does that change with experience? And, so um, right now, this is a project that's ongoing. Um, I've got some, some funding from the army for, uh, to, to build this out, but the preliminary data that went into that grant is what I'm gonna show you now. I've also presented this um, at uh, some versions of this at VSS and uh, Psychonomics, but um, just a, a first blush kind of uh, simple pass at what models we might try to, to throw in here. So we've got a, a, pretty, a pretty dumb non-neural sort of representation of just, Something that might pick up the color and low level features would be if we just do a, a pixel wise comparison of the images in RGB pix in RGB space, right? So um, really not too much, uh, it, it might be a, a, you know, it might end up being something that gets at similarities of how the brain might do color or low level shape, but it's, it, it's not neurally inspired. Um, and again, anybody has any questions or anything, please uh, feel free to interrupt and jump in raise your hand or things like that. Um, now, the second thing is a little bit more tied to the sort of work I was doing before um, using some of these sort of convolutional neural nets. Um, <clears throat> so the that HMAX model that I alluded to before has these different hierarchies that have rough correspondences to areas in 
the visual the eventual visual stream so we're going to take a particular level in that in that model the, the c2 level which is supposed to correspond roughly to um you know the v the shape tuning of v2 v to v4 sort of intermediate shape so not quite simple edges and not quite whole objects um, and then a third model we're going to try and throw in there is maybe it's something way higher than that. Maybe it's not, maybe there's some effect of the semantic meaning of these things too. And uh, this is not my area of expertise. So if there's somebody here who has this expertise, I, I would love to have a, a conversation about better models for this uh, going forward. So we used a, a, a simple semantic relationship uh, network for, known as WordNet. Um, it's kind of old, it's kind of clunky, um, but it was a it was a good first step so so these are kind of in some ways preliminary but it's just to get you uh some to demonstrate the approach and to sort of show where we're headed um so what we're able to do then is uh, i should have put a picture of it but, but for, for each of these models we can feed it every one of those distractor images and compute pairwise comparisons for each of those and build up a giant representational dissimilarity matrix you know between each object in each of these models. And then with each of those dissimilarity matrices, compare it to that dissimilarity matrix uh, in the behavior or that dissimilarity matrix and behavior across the different levels to see sort of what is the most predictive of like, um, or has the most explanatory power. So um, we do that and we do it for each level. And I'm sort of our, my Y axis here is your, the R squared of um, just one to one mapping each of those different models to the full um, the full the similarity matrix to the behavior and I'm going to do it across each of these different levels uh, as we might expect even before I showed you this data like right from the beginning the thing that sort of had color is important and sort of stays important uh, interestingly or maybe not interestingly the semantic model here totally tanks so um, it may be it, it's I think it's entirely plausible and possible that um, there's just not that much of a semantic influence on this search at this stage of the game. It may be the case that with lots and lots of experience, people start to really build up more semantic representations of these kind of funny cartoon little airport scanner uh, stimuli. But um, the the most interesting part of this for me and where I think the action is, is um, early on these sort of inter intermediate um, visual features that are sort of kind of like what might be represented in v2 to v4 um it explains some of the variants but then it sort of jumps up and kind of continues to increase so um if you remember back to sort of that spread that was happening particularly within that blue group right they were learning something and so this might indicate something like um there are intermediate feature level representations that are being um trained up or, 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 or at least they're learning to leverage them to apply to this task um, where, and they're getting more experience, they're getting better at it and they're relying on something more than just color to do so. Um, you know, this is sort of just a simple one-to-one -one, uh, thing. We could also do like a, you know, a hierarchical approach to see what kind of unique um, variance is explained by each of these models. And so this is, and we have plans to do this with lots and lots more models and this will become more interesting, but uh, just to sort of further drive this point home that um, comparing just the two models, right, the intermediate uh, feature level starts to explain more and more unique variants as the color and lower level stuff becomes sort of less and less uh, driving sort of, yeah, explains sort of less and less of the variance. Um, so Let's see. So the interim summary for this part here, um, basically that first part, you know, there's sort of, um, or sorry, the part for this is this low level model that includes color sort of explain the most variance among these three. And we, um, we have plans to obviously like flesh this out more and, and do more interesting hypothesis driven things. Um, but that advantage that it has is um, sort of decreases as experience with this seems to um, allow the searchers to leverage more and more of the intermediate features. Um, and then, so the part, that's where this sort of project is at right now. It's sort of the, this rich framework where once you get these things into this dissimilarity structure, you can, you can really go nuts and test all kinds of different things and, and, and correlate, you know, lots of different models. So, so one future direction with this, right, there's um, the, I did the HMAX model, it, because it's good, but also, and but really because it's also a thing that I have a lot of familiarity with. It was what I was using before. There are lots and lots of more complex, more um, you know, 
deep neural nets where people are really doing a lot of work to, 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 to compare lots and lots of different levels in these really deep nets that are in their essence, very similar to the HMAX model with this sort of hierarchical straightforward pass straight through it. But then they're also really new, interesting um, models that are, that are leveraging more and more brain-like structure where they have recurrent connections within levels or feedback connections, which, um, you know, the HMAX model and, and people who've done these hierarchical models are by no means saying that those sort of things aren't there or don't count, but just really sort of saying, what can we explain with that? So more and more complex models would be interesting to test with, you know, these other features of recurrence or feedback. Um, other biologically plausible models where people try to like really, really uh, stay true to the underlying physiology. There are people who've spent their lifetimes modeling, you know, the, the V1 and, and all the intricacies of those sort of things. So we could test like those sort of very, very, not just biologically inspired, but like truly replicating the biology type models. Um, so there's a whole, we're right now trying to settle on, you know, what, what is the best set of, um, probably going to start with some different, one of these deep neural nets and, you know, make some decisions about, you know, recurrence and feedback and might try and see how these different things better predict, like might better predict the behavior. Um, another thing we're, we're rolling out now is other empirical measures. So we can actually, like right now, what our behavior measure is sort of a, the similarity of these different distractors on on search. So how do each of these similar, how, how, do, how similar are the effects of finding a whole host of targets across these different things? But you could even, you could do a bunch of different empirical measures, right? I could have, um, I could do, I could show a bunch of people, you know, three of these objects and say, which two of these are the most similar and, and directly probe them to make them say, and you could give them, you could, you could have them do ratings on semantics or color or shape. You could have, um, or you could do a, a priming type study, right? You could say this image primes the name ability of this image. So, so um, the first thing we're gonna do is sort of a, a triplets task where we do that sort of like show triplets of these items and, and, and build out a more empirical measure of the similarity. Um, but I think we're also probably gonna try some kind of priming. Um, and then back to the brain, right? Can we, can we look for um, feature representations across the visual hierarchy and beyond that um, are actually, you know, actually predict the behavior. So these models are great. And at the end of the day, um, I think we can do a lot with them and I, they, they, they help us interpret a lot of things, but they're still just models, right? The, the, the gold standard is what's actually going on in the brain. So um, where it stands with that right now is I'm applying for funding to move towards that uh, with as the future direction as well. Um, how am I doing on time here? Sorry, I've got my, but, that's sort of, I wanted to then open the floor, see if there were questions or discussions about, about this particular approach, um, thoughts, ideas, and feedback about things that might be cool to, to throw in here. Um, and then depending on time, I've got a, a last little bit I could, I could do as well on a separate project. Hard to tell on these uh, video calls. Did I, have I just been talking to myself for 30 minutes do I uh <laughs> is what I'm saying making sense I've got at least at least at least half of you have video on and I'm getting nods that makes me feel good um but yeah thoughts questions uh uh this is great Pat um so maybe I can ask you a few questions um so in, in terms of the big picture of relating these computational models of the brain to um, your behavioral data from airport scanner, um, what, what sort of um, conclusions are you able to make with say, you know, with experience color plays, color has less of a correlation between the RDMs. Like, does that speak more to the interpretations of the brain models or to how we um, link those models to behavior? Um, yeah, good, good questions. You know, you always want to be, uh, be specific about the conclusions you're making and, and these sorts of things. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the models, I mean, how much it speaks to the brain is going to be sort of a, um, limited by how well the models model the brain. Um, and how there's also the, the behavior 
you know, you always want to make big generalizable claims that the behavior is also constrained by the specific, um, you know, demands of the task at hand, right? So like, you know, I definitely don't want to sort of compare, you know, a single or a, a single model or a handful of models that, that show this thing about color and then they show it in the specific, you know, within the confines of the demands of the specific search task and then go off willy nilly and say some crazy thing like, you know, you do do a hundred trials of search and your brain stops caring about color. Like you can't, you can't do that. And, 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 and um, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that I'm not coming across as saying that, but um, yeah, I think that the, the take home would be to leverage this approach to, um, you know, we care about how the, I mean, in the basic science world, right, we care about how the brain is instantiating these behaviors in, a, in applied worlds, we care about, you know, just what's going on in the behavior and can we, can we change it or train it. Um, so really, it's framed by the kind of question you're trying to ask. But um, for me, the ideal for this, the, the ideal application of this approach would be, you know, come up with a couple models that might have slightly different predictions. Um, and then look at if it, if you can find parsimonious agreement across the model, like, you know, a different prediction between the models and then see if one versus the other explains the behavior better and then down the road, hopefully, it's also better represented in the, the brain imaging. So it's sort of a, a give and take. Like, I, I don't think any one stage is like the preferred way of doing it, or I don't think any one, um, it's really just a framework of ways to ask the questions. And depending on your, your ends, like one thing could be, um, you know, the, the thing could, the things could be, your independent variables could become your dependent variables and vice versa, depending on the ways you're trying to do this. But, um, did that make sense or am I just rambling? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that made sense. Okay. And if I missed the mark, ask me again and I can try to rein that in. I have a, a question. Uh, first off, this work is like really cool. And um, I, I play a lot in the space of like reward representations. Um, and so mostly looking at the other half of the brain and how, um, yeah, like how semantic or like motivational features are represented um, when we're seeking different rewards. So, so this is really cool. Um, and I think a really clever like application of um, like this to a behavioral data set. Um, so I had um, a question about um, your like the the initial kind of like performance like by like target and like distractor like table um, and and I just want to kind of clarify like in your model like is the performance really just like related to that at like one to one like mapping, if, if, if I'm following correctly, that's what's happening. And if it would be interesting, or like if there would be a way to kind of look at how um, distractors function in parallel. So like, you know, maybe like it doesn't matter if like the headphones are there or if the stethoscope is there, but if the headphones and the stethoscope are there, and so is the assault rifle, for some reason, that is like the the perfect storm of um, poor performance or something like that. And if there's like ways to model, yeah, the interactions between certain distractor variables and their effect on target performance. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very, that's, I mean, that's very interesting. I and mean, they're, they're certainly possible. There certainly could be second order effects like that. Um, the, the wrinkle there is the the combinatorial explosion there becomes a bit intractable. So um, now that's not me. Well, I think so. Right. The the thing here, right, is like we have to have a ton of data to even sort of feel good about the way that we're the way that we're even able to do this sort of one to one pair thing is like I wouldn't feel good about doing this with like much less data, and we've got a ton of data, and I I don't think the combinatorial explosion of like just sort of without a hypothesis sort of trying to build up that structure would be tough. But I mean, you could come up with a hypothesis, right? If you had a reason to believe 
that um yeah i'm trying to think of maybe it's within the framework of the game if there's like this thing isn't distracting unless it's paired with this or you know you could imagine i mean in um you know in actual tsa world right like certain things yeah like you know a single bottle of liquid this big isn't a problem but if you have three others then maybe those could be combined like you could you could imagine where like those interactions might exist and influence actual real world search um i it would be hard to do it but if you came up with a good hypothesis not a good reason for it you can certainly look for it so yeah interesting question Yeah, really interesting work. Uh, I'm just wondering when you were showing how the low level versus the intermediate and the semantic, uh, how those presented differently, uh, if you could go back to that graph. Um, yeah, the graph of the three. Uh, because you show that uh, the low level says consistently high, whereas the intermediate levels do show improvements over. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about how, like the differences between levels one and two, and then from two on, uh, whether that might be uh, the more important uh, experience? Yeah, um, good question. So with, within the actual game, like because it is a game and not a not a in lab experiment this this is one of the other challenges with this is that some things do change but so from level to level like the conveyor belt that things come in on speeds up a little so it like it does um get harder as you go to sort of match with experience so some demands change that way the um certain the, the, the proportion of like there are like different levels of difficulty within a bag that determine how many items might be there and so throughout the um the the later levels do have a little more uh we have a higher proportion of bags with more stuff in it so like to do this to do this really cleanly like when we get to the point of like publishing this sort of stuff we're going to try and control for all those sorts of things we might even get to the point where we're modeling within a level so that those sort of across level things don't change as much um but it is yeah it's a, it's a good question um within the game certain things like uh you know there's some of the early on in the game like targets tend to be blue so like there's different um, parameters within the game that that make color important so um you know when when presenting these results and uh and trying to generalize it's really important to to consider all of that so that's a that's a sharp question um the fact that the the fact that the color and low level feature thing remains high um is is sort of why we then looked at that sort of like the unique variance explained sort of thing because if you think about it that really that low level representation is like a really dumb non-neural sort of thing right just taking the the rgb space and then comparing the two things like um there's a lot of shape and color information kind of jammed into one that was um a pretty blunt model that's not telling us much about what the brain does so um at the end of the day, the fact that, you know, that information is what the intermediate, like that's that's the input information into the model for the HMAX or really any computer vision model, right? The, um, so the information about shape is contained in that too. It's just not contained in a neural like way. So um, the, that's why just looking at one versus the other uh, or looking at one without comparing for what is explained by the other, um, kind of is less informative so like that's why the unique the next the, this next part where we looked at like what's unique about the two was like the next step but i mean at the end of the day right we're going to come at this with a much more um coming out we're going to come at it from more of a, a biologically inspired set of models where the, the differences aren't so stark um this rgb model is, is kind of a in some ways sort of a, a first pass example but a but a kind of a throwaway when it comes to actual neural representation Hi, uh, I have a question. I think this is uh, really cool. I actually have two questions. So first question is, do you apply any data cleaning uh, procedure to your data? Like this is a, a smartphone game. So people might do something and left 
and then return back to the, the game. And another one is also related to the task. I wonder if there is any time limits when they perform each trials. I think that will affect the way they perform the task. And because your uh, the dis dissim dissimilarity metrics is based on their task performance. And you also mentioned uh, maybe we can later use just a similarity judgment and ask them to how similar this two uh, objects uh, is. So I wonder how the task itself will affect the judgment and, and then it will affect that metrics and then affect your later result. Yeah, yeah, um, all, all good points. So let me, let me see if I can take them point by point here. Um, so regarding the first question, yep. So it's, a, it's an app, it's uh, in a lot of ways different from what's going on in our labs, a uh, lot less control of the environment and all kinds of crazy stuff. So, um, but in some ways, some of the data clean, some aspects of data cleaning is the same. So we're like, okay, this, you know, the data that are outliers with RT or, um, you know, there are ways to just pick out this subject is not doing this with their, their whole effort or, or something has happened here. And, you know, they're on the bus and somebody bumps them or they pause the game to, uh, because their boss walked in and they were playing while at work or <laughs> things like that. Right. But, um, so we, we do some simple stuff where we just say like, you know, these, um, these RTs are outliers, you know, based on similar ways that we might attack in lab data. Um, the, there, it, there is some difficulty with, um, well, let's see. So we, we do some very simple data cleaning like that, but really in a lot of ways too, we just sort of, uh, we rely on the size of the data to like, it's noisier, but it's not the, 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 the amount that it's noisier is more than overcompensated by like the amount of data we have in a lot of instances. So, you know, we, we, we just, you know, we, we are, um, yeah, we, we screen out obvious fluky data and then from there kind of just throw it all in. Um, you know, we, we are, we're sort of trying to figure out, you know, better and better ways to do that. So, yeah, yeah. if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. But, um, and then specifically talking about the, the, the constraints of the task itself, there, there is time pressure. So they, the things come by on a conveyor belt and you like, you can move it. So you can like stop it and hold it. But in most of the levels of the game, we, we were able to collaborate with the company to make like a, an R and D level that's a little cleaner and a little less cartoony that you can stop and it lets you look for as long as possible so we can go. But like, if you hold the thing for too long, it, it like breaks the little scanner. Like there's, there's time pressures. So for sure, uh, I agree that, um, yeah, again, like the, the, the constraints of the task we're going to affect how you do it and, and time pressure is part of it. Um, and yeah, similarly, I, I totally agree that um, doing it with doing a different empirical task on it might get at different things. And that's kind of why we want to just go ahead and do it and see, see what, what comes out. Um, and there was more in that second part, but I'm, I've, I've lost the thread. Was there more, was there part that I didn't get to there? I think that is. Yeah, okay. Cool. Um, I have like, there's like one other little thing that I could show you guys or we can keep talking more where I, where I have you, you know, till two, right? So how are people feeling? Any more questions on this part? I'll just quickly breeze through this the second part that I have on here then because I think it's kind of cool, interesting, and it's it's pretty brief. Um, so work from our lab recently done by our grad student who just graduated, Michelle Kramer, has been looking at sort of the effects of sort of basically like sequence effects. So like how your trial history affects um, things. And this is really just a, a excuse for me to plug the preprint down here. But <laughs> um, the the basics, so in addition to the search task, we have this little object sorting task. So this is another interesting aspect of the data where single items come on and people have to decide if they're allowed or prohibited, um, which um, which can be cool. Like it can actually get at some of the questions uh, that we were just discussing, right? Like how do, how do the constraints of the task shape behavior? So, so this is sort of another insight into something about that decision of if the thing is prohibited or not. And so the way that this works, people do 
you know, they have a time limit that was sort of this bar up here and then it's up to 22 items and they do as many as they can. Um, and so what my colleague, uh, Michelle has done was looked at essentially, you know, how every um, possible pass sequence up to the up to the 10th trial affects how you might perform. So basically like what's indicated in color is how many items you've seen previously that were prohibited. So like you can see, you know, if you've only seen, if you haven't seen many, then like the more and more you see, then it means like the lower and lower proportion. So your accuracy goes down when you do see one, kind of like you're expecting it less. Um, but then also within like on your eighth trial, you can see if you've only seen, if you haven't seen any distractors versus everything you've seen before as a distractor, there's a huge difference when you see it, I'm oh, sorry, every time it's a distractor, I'm prohibited, right? So it's this idea that um, basically like the proportion, so like if you've seen six out of six targets on your seventh trial and you get a target, you'll be better than if you've seen five out of six. But it's also true that having seen six out of six on your seventh trial confers a larger advantage than having seen five out of five on your sixth trial. So you're sort of building up evidence and expectation and, and um, Michelle and uh, big insights from Droid on this as well. We, we sort of came to the realization that we could um, essentially roll in both of those two, both the proportion and the number into this sort of z-score. So like, you know, basically like a binomial z. So like the number of times you've seen a target can be converted into like a z-score for evidence. And so when we did that with this tart with this object sorting trial thing, so like for instance, you can. Sorry, I'm blocking my interview with the video here. <clears throat> um, all right, so like this one point converts to a z-score of around two, and we can do it for this other point, and then we can do it for like all of the points. Credit to Michelle for the cool animation on this. But like when you do it for all of the points, you actually can see that the, the accuracy is hugely shaped by your past experience and really nicely predicted by this pretty simple um, sort of evidence accumulation model. Um, and so we have the, in that preprint, um, she's done a lot of great work showing that it generalizes across tasks. So this is doing that same thing in not the object sorting task, but you can look for the same thing, the sequence of bags containing a target versus not. And you can see that same thing for the hit rate in the search task and, you know, inversely true for like the response times, right? The more you're expecting a thing and you get a thing, you're fast. If you're expecting one thing and you get the other, you're slow. Um, and so this is just laying the groundwork of, can we leverage this understanding uh, to remove some of the unexplained variance in behavioral data? Um, so like, and again, this is just a real quick, like a uh, toy model of, you know, say you have a subject who this, you know, this is their response time and this is the evidence and you have two conditions and like, you know, Theoretically, right, say that it's a, it's a small effect between the two conditions compared to the size of that evidence effect that I just showed you, right? So, you know, these two conditions are really muddled up between each other. But if you were to then model that evidence uh, and then remove it and just look at just the residuals, then you start to see some separation between these two things. So we find ourselves sort of wondering, can we, can we remove um, these sequences? And it's sort of, again, the, the, the the big picture of my talk here was this idea of leveraging ideas from um, fMRI and, and brain imaging to uh, our understanding of, of behavioral data. Um, we do something like this when we do the, the you know, the, the big, um, your design matrix for, you know, your, your MRI, right? You might have like, this is sort of one of the design matrices for the imaging I was showing you at the beginning, right? These subjects did four blocks of things where there were six things we cared about and the sort of six motion parameters we don't, right? And then you have, so these things like the block or these things like the motion parameters, it's a model of stuff we don't care about and we remove it to better get at what we do care about. And so um, it's interesting to think, could we do the same thing for behavior? You know, there's a lot of stuff that's noise, a lot of stuff that we average over to remove, but like, could we actually get away with um, finding more, like, better resolving actual effects by removing this stuff with a model rather than just kind of, um, you know, just averaging over it. So I have more that I could do on that, but I wanted to just plug Michelle's work and this cool direction going forward that we have, because it also sort of fits under what we were talking about here today. Uh, so yeah, just wanted to thank my 
my collaborators in the lab and uh, the funding. And we could talk more about that last idea that I super quick breeze through, but we're kind of up against the end here. Um, but thank you all for your attention as well. Thoughts on that last little bit? Any questions or questions more generally? Cool. Well, thank you guys again for having me here. And it was really nice to get to talk to my work and uh, meet, meet those of you who I haven't met before. And yeah, you know, seeing some of those of you who I've seen at conferences. I guess that's mostly just you, uh, Scott. Although I see Molly was here at the bottom. I've met her at conferences too. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks Thanks so much, Pat, again, for, for joining us. Um, and yeah. Um, if there's any lingering questions, we can we can connect you to people too, um, if that's helpful. And um, and yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, any questions that that come that that come to mind after this, I love discussing things like this. So yeah, email and uh, yeah. Otherwise, this was a blast. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Right. See you all next month. <laughs>